lights here. I just realized I have my, I was auditioning for a job as a traffic cone today. I forgot to put my, my, my other shirt on. Oh my cow. Anyway. That's what you do as a retired captain when you when nobody else wants you. You you go down to the Department of Transportation and see if you can audition as a traffic cone. So anyway, welcome everybody. <laughs> this is Fearless Flight Live, uh, a another edition this week, and uh, I'd like to welcome you and anybody out there. This is for people who are afraid to fly, uh, or you know somebody's afraid to fly, or you just like to talk about airplanes and and airports and and right now all that's going on with the airports. We have a, a, uh, a group that we like to advertise every week called Fearless Flight Birds of a Feather. And uh, we, we're over 600 uh, members now and we'd love to keep it growing. We got, a, uh, got some good momentum going. And that is a great place for you to talk to other people in the same boat or in the same plane, if you will, as you are. And uh, we also monitor that and provide support uh, with everybody out there. Uh, this is our weekly show course. We, we go on at 6.30 on the uh, West Coast, 9.30 on the, on the uh, east, uh, Eastern time zone there. And tonight we're going to uh, talk about these things uh, that are uh, kind of current out there. Let me wait until that slide comes up for you. Should be okay, up uh, this is our poll question uh, for the week. I was just curious to see how many books you think the average American reads in a year. It, that's always a fun question for me. I used to be zero until they came out with audiobooks, and uh, that changed my life uh, uh, several years ago now. Uh, that's a big part of my belief in how you get better in life uh, is uh, to learn something. And, and I know the people with the greatest sense of curiosity are the ones that tend to do, especially about themselves and learning about uh, all things aviation and, and their triggers. Those are the people that, that tend to do the best in overcoming their fear of flying. We have a special guest, Paul Santa Cruz, who you can see walking along. We grabbed him live, actually on the job, and uh, hopefully nobody at, at work is watching him, because, or you're on, I guess you're on a break, right, Paul? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll be talking to him in just a minute. Uh, he happens to have a history uh, of being afraid to fly, and he's going to talk about uh, that history a little bit. And he's, and he's, he's currently taking the, uh, the 201 online masterclass. So he's going to share with us uh, what that's meant to him. Uh, I advertised today when I was on my bike with my trusty uh, canine friend Rocco. We're going to talk about anchors. I'm just going to briefly mention that tonight. We're, we got we ended up with a, a lot more content than what I anticipated, and but I'm going to I have a special offer for anybody out there if you if you want to learn more about that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the 201 module that we did last week, module three, and a highlight for the one next week. And then we got a couple of things in the aviation news, mostly related to how the airlines are operating right now. So with that, uh, don't forget to put your name in there, leave us a comment, and particularly uh, take a guess at how many books you think the average American reads in a year. And I'll talk about that when we wind up at the end here. So, okay, well, I'd like to, to uh, introduce again, Paul Santa Cruz. And Paul and I met, oh my gosh, it's probably been at least, uh, I want to say five years ago, but it's probably more like 10 or so when you say. Yeah. 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 Almost uh, seven or eight years I've been in Phoenix. So yeah. yeah since yeah, the start. Okay. Yeah. 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 So if you want, just, just let the folks know, you know, uh, you know, uh, who we are, you work for a major airline. We're going to leave it at that. And you're actually on duty. We thought he, he's going to, he's going to be our live cameraman here as well. He's going to show us <laughs> a little bit of the ghost town at the airport and, 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 and feel free to share that about just what it's like compared to what it used to be. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, it's a, it's a big yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. This Look. is uh, this is one of your major coffee shops, and this is a concourse that basically oh my God. Yeah. all the flights are done it for. And yeah, I mean, so, this, would be, this would be right in the middle of a huge bank of flights. Oh yeah, just, yeah. All uh, the yeah. flights are done on Tuesdays and Saturdays. We're done with all our flights by about uh, four thirty, five o'clock. Now most of the flights are eight to five, and then after that, we only have like five East Coast flights, three East Coast flights. And as you can see, all the planes that are parked are all planes that have come in for the day that are overnighting to take out flights tomorrow. So yeah. basically, this is your airport. Wow. And as you can see, there is not many people flying. So we appreciate everybody who does fly right now. Understandably, um, it's keeping us going. So 
This is the so airport. So, Paul, how, how long have you been an airline employee? Um, I started in 1988. So, for 30 years, I've been working. Okay. This is and my first lo- career and, job. Yeah. And and how long or when did you, when did you notice that you had a, 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 a get triggered by flying? And, and well, this is an interesting story. That. Okay. Uh, I started um, in 88 uh, with the major airline that I'm, I'm with now. And uh-huh. Previous to that, I went to an airline academy, and this is an interesting story, and I developed a fear of flying right before I went to the going to, to go for a job for a reservation agent to a school <laughs> that was going to teach me. It gets better. I took a 36-hour bus ride to Portland, Oregon, because I was so afraid to fly, and I had a ticket at that time on Republic Airlines. Oh, my so, gosh. So I finished the class, but I figured that, that once I finished it, I'd be able to drive. And so fortunately, when they hired me, I didn't have to fly. I just drove to the reservation center. And then it probably took me about another six months before I got on a plane, even though I was taking reservations every day. What was it? Was the reservation center here in in the Phoenix area or was it? It was was in uh, Chico, California. Started with an airline called Pacific Express. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that was my first career back in probably like in the late. 70s yeah, yeah. So i've been doing it for a while yeah well when I, when i took over the, i i had i was invited to participate in in the clear for takeoff program here at phoenix by a psychologist originally he's the one that started the program and then i ended up getting my master's and taking it over around 2000 my the, like the second class that i was totally responsible for myself uh i had a lady in america west res- reservations at the time and she lay she talked to me about that very thing she said you're not she said i i you I've been looking all over for you. And she wasn't herself was not afraid to fly, but she said she worked with a number of employees who came to work at the airline for the benefits, but were afraid to fly. And she yeah, said, there's a lot of us out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then she talked about the fact that when people called in in reservations, she, she frequently talked to people who were afraid to fly and they would ask her, you know, what can I do? And all that. And so, so she's the one that really got me back into where we we then started flying classes with people again so anyway so that's interesting and so then then you you flew in about six months and what was that like uh six Um, months after you got hired it was really scary because i was flying for at the time uh it made a lot of stops and my home was las vegas and i lived in chico california so i would have to go chico to san francisco san francisco to sacramento sacramento to los angeles los angeles to las vegas and so (laughs) the milk run but Probably for a fearful flyer, one flight is good for you. I had to do four. So yeah. it it was convincing. But, you know, going back to like you were saying, Ron, a lot of times we tell stories. And I'm probably one of the best storytellers that can put myself in an airline crash and a situation where the plane's not going to make it. Right. All these, you know, where you're talking about the elephant and the eagle. I think it's the elephant and the yeah, eagle, correct yeah. me from them. And yeah. my, my elephant tends to go off, you know, but once we're in flight, because I've flown a lot. I'm comfortable once we get in the air, but it's sort of like those, those you anticipate, like if you're doing a wedding and you plan it months and months in advance and you lose weight and you do all these things and you get to that point where it happens and it's no big deal. And it seems like that's what it is with the fear of flying for me. Once I get to that point where I can fly, it's like, why did I wait so long? Why did I do this? And one of the most exciting things is when I went on a flight with Ron and one of everybody was kind of anticipating a little bit nervous going over to Burbank. And when we came, once the plane got in the air, everybody was planning their trips on the plane where they're going on their next trip. It's yeah. just, and then like like Eric was saying, you're so exhausted from, from everything that you build it up to be, which it's not, that going back, you're all sleeping and there's no concern about anything happening on the plane. You're completely safe. That first flight just got you over it and you're coming back and you're good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, you, so when I put that, we, we were going to have a live 201 class, which is what you took s- several years ago, and right. then we we're going to fly again. And of course, COVID 19 took care of both of those. So, when we, when we put it online, I, it's, it's real, I was really excited about your, your willingness to come on tonight because I wanted you to talk about, you know, how the online class has been for you, you know, compared to, you know, having done it face to face and all that. You know, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, I really enjoy it because we do the breakaway in the room and you get to know other people that are just kind of in the same situation and really where they're coming from and what what triggers them 
And a lot of times the things that trigger them are things that are similar to yours. So it's sort of like you have a camaraderie that we're all in kind of the same kind of situation, the same boat, and that it, it, it's a real thing there. And, you know, you really want to work it through. And it, it's hard because, like, I remember we were talking about in the class where we were talking about, oh, my gosh, I don't have to fly. Something came up. I didn't have to fly. You just got saved from the biggest, you know, thing of your life. And <laughs> And but then it comes with the shame comes with it next. It's like, oh, no, I didn't yeah. go, you know, so and what you're um, talking about is I think right off the bat last week we had uh, in, the, in the last module on Sunday, we had somebody that, that, that when I ask what is it that really keeps you off the airplane and, and and a couple of people shared that that when they had gotten off previously and when they get off of course there's this real surge of relief and it, yeah. it literally oh, yeah. is all it, it's all these endorphins because you've let yourself off the hook and so that's like a drug it is a drug it's just na naturally made and so that reinforces the good feeling about getting off the airplane and it makes it harder for the next time you you, you go to fly out there so but you, you know what really helps Ron, is that the information because i you know it, i tend to you know i tend to exasperate things and make them more than they are it's like yeah. being a type a personality that's the industry that's me um but you give us more information, which you give us in the, in the modules and numbers and st statistics, that makes a huge difference in, in feeling comfortable on an aircraft. Yeah. And, you know, we, the numbers of, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say one of the advantages of the online class is we, 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 we meet four times and, and it's really about twice the amount of content that I could squeeze in when we do it face to face at the airport there. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, with the with the uh, with the online class, we covered oh my gosh, at least two hours of everything in a flight. And when you go into and Eric, thank you also. Um, I got the pre-flight. Uh, 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 I downloaded that. And when you go into how a dispatcher six hours, like when you're in bed <laughs> before the pilot even gets there, all this stuff is being checked and rechecked and the flying and the, the, the system itself being rechecked and rechecked. It's the safety inherent factor, the built in that makes it okay. Yeah, cool. So we're, let's- we're spooled, up, we're spooled up to about 90% of whatever it is we're gonna do before we ever get to the airplane. Yeah, all I see is the checklist. You know what I mean? That's all I yeah. see on TV, but you have no idea the back background as far as how many things go into a flight before you even get on the plane, you know, on the safety factors. And then the training that you guys have is amazing. So, I mean, I feel completely safe with that, though, that information to go with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me do this. I want to talk about something called anchors, which is really kind of a, a, another term for, from, from another part of psychology, but what are some of the things you, you mentioned that you, you just start to have this really super active mind that, that builds all these scenarios about what can happen to the airplane. So what are some of the specific things that you know that you you imagine that you're going to die on an airplane or or you know what it what is that like give us a couple of them okay well i'll give you an example i once was on i, I flew back and forth to las vegas from here in phoenix and i used to live in las vegas and work here in phoenix so i would go back and forth every day it was routine every flight every day is fine and one day and here's the overactive mind again because i talked to some pilots on this um our landing gear was hot out of las vegas now uh -huh. you and eric and, and Dieter could probably explain that so the pilot explained, came on this on the on the intercom and told us all he's going to drop the landing gear while we're in flight to cool it off because that's the procedure they do. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're going, you know that that amount of speed and you drop something comes down, it's like sticking your hand <laughs> out the window. Right. It's going to be bumpy. It's going to bounce around a lot, you know. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, oh my god, the the landing gear is hot. We're not going to be able to land. There's going to be emergency trucks. We're going to have to land on the foam and all that. And no big deal. Um, before we landed, the landing gear was cooled off. We were good to go. Smooth yeah, landing, yeah. and they kept us surprised of the whole situation. So uh, that's the that's the fear. You know what I mean? The the um, like you get on an international flight, and the first thing I'm thinking is that a terrorist is going to attack the flight. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. then I have to rationalize. No, I'm safe on this plane. The way that you've taught us to you know, to rationalize instead of going with the elephant, but to, to go with the true facts. Sure. 
sure. instead of the irrational and, and fears. Eric, you want to say just a couple of words about about you know why we he experienced that on a leg between Phoenix and in uh, Las Vegas, dropping the gear as opposed to you know why we wouldn't do that from Phoenix to New York. So, so probably what happened is is most of the new gen airplanes they can take their own temperature and everything else to tell themselves how they feel, and one of the things <laughs> they talk about in the, they're taught the airplane goes, you don't have to talk to me. I'll talk to myself. I'm having a great time doing it too. And I'm sending the information off to the manufacturer, back to the company, everywhere else. I mean, it's just crazy. But one of the things most of new gen airplanes monitor is, is brake temperatures. And if it's if it's warm out and we or brutally hot, like some places we've been, when you taxi, you build up heat in the brakes, even though you're not riding them or using them, because the airplane's more designed to fly than it is to drive around. And so as you start to build up heat uh, in the brakes, there's, there's limit temperatures there that become of concern. And, and the airplane may or may not have brake fans, and you can run those while you're taxiing. And after you take off, if you have a normal takeoff, you can, you can leave the landing gear extended for a while. Um, um, and, and then when you're up to a good temperature, retract it. And same thing on the arrival on that short leg. Um, boy, that's, those are creepy videos. I got to tell you, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. And, <laughs> no, that's okay. And, and a short leg, especially like Phoenix, Vegas, where it's going to be hot there and you can extend the gear early. You can drop it in the airstream and, and, and get some free cooling as well before you land, apply brakes when you know you're going to generate more heat stopping and then more heat taxing just as a conservative thing to do. Yeah. And so, so the, to just kind of piece this together, we're going to talk, I want to talk just briefly about the concept of anchors. So the landing gear can then become an anchor, a negative one for you. And it's right, the way, right. so, so just that activity, you can be, you could be sleeping, you know, and, and, and when we put the gear down normally, you know, all of a sudden that triggers that part of your memory. And it says, Oh man, I remember that we had a problem someday because you're not likely to remember the details from that. You know, it, 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 per, first of all, the cap, the pilots probably didn't give you that many details probably. No. And so the next time that happens, it triggers you in a negative way and that's called an anchor. And, and there, we don't often think about the, the positive ones as fearful flyers, but for people who have all of us, you know, if you grew up and your grandma was a great cook, a great baker, you know, and she made chocolate chip cookies a lot, you probably have an anchor for that. As a matter of fact, mobile home or not mobile homes, but when they model homes, when they're selling homes in a subdivision, they will often put simmering vanilla on the stove to, to have the, the uh, aroma of, of, homemade cookies and well probably use actual cookies in some cases but that it just sends that that fragrance through your your nose and it and it and everybody gets anchored in those positive warm feelings of home and and so they use it to sell homes advertising is all about that sight sounds sensations and and to get people to buy things so well i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna have you stay here for just a minute uh what i wanted to do tonight and we're i'm gonna skip over the, any any further deliberations about anchors i'm gonna create a special video for people if you want to do that and uh and 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 a procedure that that i that uh, i have adapted for people who are afraid to fly that actually tells you how to change your state of mind and deal with anchors or triggers like that so uh, Dieter, why don't you tell everybody how they can get, sign up for that if they want yeah actually it's it's quite easy just um just type in uh, please send me the video or a video, yes, please, or however short you can make it for yourself, and we can discern that you want it, and we're gonna send it to you in the messenger um, right back once uh, once you have uh, created the video run. And so that goes for anybody listening live with us yeah. or anybody that should hear the replay. So yeah. okay. Let, let's talk real briefly, uh, uh, Paul, about the, the, the 201 Module 3. Well, we, you can say anything about the class that you, you want, but Module 3 that we just completed last week, we, 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 we review a, a little bit of 1 and 2 when we started, and then, and then we get into 3, and we did a mock flight. So you were talking about that when we first made it. You, so you want to tell everybody what, kind of what that was like? Oh, it was – okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, it was a lot of fun because – okay. Um, we actually were, and Ron told me this, we were the engines, so our woe would get the airplane in the air, and our woe would help the airplane land, so we became the engine, and we actually got to see like a video of actually San Diego, 
And it was the realest thing I've seen as far as actually flying to see the actual runway, see actually them banking, turning and everything. Um, it was it was pretty awesome. Um, and it was fun because we were all doing it together as a group. And uh, I think we had like 12 on there on, on Sunday, yeah, if I'm yeah. not wrong. And yeah, there we have we have 50. We've, we've had actually we doubled the size of the class since we started. So I wanted to remind everybody, even though that we have the last module coming up this Sunday, module four, it's going to be a wrap up of everything that we've done a, a review and it's and questions that have that have uh, yet to be answered. And I've got to, I always have some special bonuses that I'm going to uh, do as well. So if you if you still are interested in joining the class, you can do that. Dieter will put a link in the uh, notes there. And uh, uh, so we're looking forward to having everybody. Uh, Eric, you want you got any comments about or any questions for uh, Paul about the class? I just had to throw in two or three. Well, and and last week, not to give you a plug, but you came within a whisker losing a thousand dollars to one of the viewers on that stupid <laughs> color slide matrix. Went, oh man, he's gonna regret this. <laughs> and, and all the that's the problem with the fearless flyers they all have great big brains on them they can't shut them off and i said but he picked the wrong freaking group to do this with you're going to get burned on that sometime yeah <laughs> those are, those we were like we were just just for fun we were reviewing the elephant brain and how it works and in how when you when you shift modes and all that and so i have this little thing and i offer people a thousand bucks if you can read it once and then and then we change the colors of these words and then you have to read it again and uh, we did we had uh, uh was it uh, Susan, right? Susan yeah. was the, the one last. She was doing really good. She almost had it at the very end. She yeah. was yeah. pretty close yeah. with that oh, last you line. You had to have been sweating a little. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Paul, is it? I just got to ask you: Is it creepier there at night than it is now? Because it looks like you're starring in a Stephen King shorty video. I'm just now <laughs> watching you. That's bizarre. Uh, it's. Uh, I start at three thirty, and we don't have our first flight. I think until eight thirty. So yeah, it's pretty slow. Yeah, it's uh, it's we're hoping people come back little by little. They're coming back, and if we get you know more and more people coming back, it's always it's always a blessing, you know. Because yeah. it, it's yeah. just it, it, this is just the planes that you're seeing here I, yeah. that are can in you, for the can night. Can you switch your camera, Paul? So yeah, we can. Okay. The planes oh. that you're seeing here, there's only going to be three that are going out tonight. These are all in for the night. And then across the runway, which I can't really get a shot, but you can probably get the Southwest. These are all planes that are just parked. And I, you know what? I'm going to go over the other side of the concourse. We actually have planes parked on the other side of the airport. And if you drive on the uh, north side of the airport, those are all planes that are not flying right now. Well, my last, my last two uh, uh, comments were I hope you're keeping track of your steps because you knocked down a lot of them just during the show. <laughs> And, oh, and, I get a lot of time to walk on this job right now, and they understand that because, you know, it's just uh, there is nothing for us to do right now as far as, you know, there's no no passengers, so we're just hoping we're going to get passengers back. And I'm going to call airport ops and tell them what a good job they've done on those ceiling tiles that we were watching <laughs> while you were talking the whole time. <laughs> Right. It's really good. <laughs> so let's let's just spend just a couple minutes here, Paul. And and okay, uh, we you guys had a pretty good conversation going earlier, just about the differences, you know, uh, or what's really going on out there as far as boarding airplanes. Uh, there's there was there there was an article in the paper uh, or in the, in my news feed yesterday. It says empty middle seat, big question mark. And it said, uh, in some countries, yes, they're not booking the middle seat, but in the U.S. and Europe, they're not. Yeah, both of you guys, you might want to comment on that, uh, or starting with you, Paul. Yeah, um, we're we're trying to we're social distancing best we can. We're we're taking our aircraft down to I think seventy or eighty five percent and trying to get a middle seat. Um, but some of our flights and some of our hubs, they are going out full. So even with the capacity that they're down to a lower capacity, we're still filling them up. So. It's not all the time guaranteed a middle seat, but we are trying to do social distancing best we can with what we have. And still, I forgot what it was. You need a certain load factor to make money on a flight. Yeah. So that's the big thing now. I know I and just it's, saw and an article. It's not, and it's not 14 people on a 180 seat airplane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I forgot what it was. Um, uh, yeah. I believe it's Delta Airlines is adding additional flights. They just put that in the media now. Um, okay. Because of their their load factors are so low, they're going to add additional flights for the safe distance. So, and if you if you want to know, you know, if uh, what it's like with with the, you know how you can change those anchors and those triggers for you when related to COVID nineteen, 
when you get scrunched and things like that, or you have somebody in the middle seat, uh, make sure you sign up for the video because I'm going to talk about that. How specifically, you know, techniques that you can use to help transform your your thoughts to uh, if you're forced into that uh, uncomfortable space that uh, that bothers everybody out there. So, um, the, let's see. There's a couple, one other thing I was going to talk about here real quick. Um, Oh, uh, T TSA is preparing to check passenger temperatures at airports amid uh, coronavirus concerns. Have you heard anything about that, Paul? Or, or uh, they you know? are, they are. Uh, they're trying. I saw they're trying to get a, some kind of a bill that's passed that they're uh, they're going to do it. I know for employees, we're doing it right now, but I but I understand that's in the works. And I understand in Europe, they're already doing it on on several airlines over there now. And it's not actually, it's not the little individual thing, right? No, it's the it. thermal it's a very sophisticated. One. It's yeah, very sophisticated. Yeah. It's the whole body temperature. It's not yeah. the thermal one because they say the thermal one just sometimes only gets your you know your temperature on your head. So yeah, this yeah. is the whole body one. Have they given so you that, any? Have they given you any ad advice as to when that might you might see that at, at, in Phoenix here? I have not, but I, I I know that they're in the works. So um, okay. I would I, I think it's going to be a good thing. It's because it's hard to measure if someone is sick on an aircraft. It's it's hard to tell that other than, you know, the signs that they're showing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and do you know, what if they are, if, 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 they, if their temperature is high, what, what's the plan? Um, usually they don't board them on the flight. You know, if yeah. it's, it's, it's a something that we call that we call our air medics and check on that and see what, uh, you know, what, what they would, especially if they identify themselves and say, hey, I'm, I'm not feeling well. Then yeah, yeah, we take them off the flight and let them reschedule to later date. So that that is definitely. I got a funny story. If I got a second to tell you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I flew about three, four months ago, I think it was, and a lady uh -huh. got on the plane. It was a full flight, and she took Lysol and she Lysoled everybody's seat. She Lysoled <laughs> my seat, Lysoled my tray table, and she said she was just doing housekeeping, and we all thought she was crazy. But you know how, how perspectives change. Now yeah. look at that same person <laughs> going on a plane. Everybody would be Lysoling the plane. So yeah, it's, it's just amazing. interesting how things have changed since COVID and it's a different world that we're, that we're now in. Yeah. And have you seen evidence from your point of view of the, the, uh, the increase in, in standards and sanitation that they're, that they're doing on the airplanes? Oh yeah. Yeah. They're doing electrostatic and the cleaning and everything. It's just uh, it takes a long time now to get an aircraft ready, but they are, they are they, there's, there's uh, no more services anything that's uh, got touch on it so basically there's no more service with uh beverages we give actual uh a uh a snack and water to passengers on a long-haul flight so therefore yeah. they will not be getting any drinks on the flight they've already been given that when they board the flight okay again because of there's so many different touches to that surface so they try to eliminate everything out on that now okay well any uh uh, Dieter, any questions for Paul or or Eric? Do you have anything else? And uh, otherwise, we'll we'll start wrapping this up. I, I was just grateful. I mean, it, we should have just taken the night off and had Paul carry it because that was very insightful, Paul. Um, I, I was also grateful before I came up. I was just glancing at CNN and they had a doctor commenting that I hadn't seen before, and somebody specifically asked about airplane inside the airliner environment, and she was addressing the atmosphere, the filters, and the fact that research takes fresh air and is dumping that cabin every three, four minutes so you're not trapped in a building. It was a, it was A, true, and it was B, a nice public service thing uh, for her to put out there that, that you're not in as tough a shape as you think trapped in there. Um, you're getting fresh air through the airplane, especially now with the load factors light. But I, as you said, the, the uh, load factor isn't a big deal. It's the only deal. It would be fascinating to see with this middle seat argument, if it gets legislated or all the airlines adopt it, what will happen to the ticket prices? Because it's easy to take a seat out and physically have the space empty, but but eventually um, the airlines have to be north of zero um, in terms of in terms of a profit margin, or as the airline guys like to say at the RASM, the revenue available seat per seat mile. And they're gonna to have to generate enough per seat, no matter how many seats are in the airplane, so that they can have a have a, uh, a flight that's that's uh, uh, making money instead of losing money. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, and, any questions here? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I I just want to acknowledge uh, Sue and Michelle. I saw your comments. They um they said they want the video. Um, <laughs> um, and Tayen says they're not even. She's a flight attendant. She says we're not even brewing coffee anymore. I mean, that is, <laughs> no, that right, is the, <laughs> it's which true. is probably good news for some people who really like coffee. So, anyway. um, but, I, but I do want to thank you, Paul, because, you know, um, <clears throat> I know maybe not many fearful flyers appreciate airports, but I've always loved airports, actually, personally. And just they're like these amazing hubs and in this case, they are like the front lines of, um, you know, of transmission, you know? Right, so right, exactly. It, and I have, you know, read and, and talked with people in Europe and, and other places. Um, there's going to be some really interesting innovation because yeah. social distancing is not going to be feasible in air travel. And so they will have to come up with these interesting um innovations which will again i'm not saying everything will be great or good but yeah it definitely it will, is. it'll spur a whole new um era of airport you know development yeah, it may not be the best yet to come but there will be a lot yet to come for sure <laughs> so anyway i'm going to throw out there the average number of books that, it, that according to a, a research done in 2018 is 12 books per year that's up about 30 years ago, it was 0.5. So uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. now, and, and a lot of that is attributed to the, the audiobooks and uh, and podcasts are actually helping with that. I'm a big podcast fan. I've always been a big audio fan. I did not uh, fan, I did not read uh, many traditional books uh, when I was younger. And, uh, and we know a book that you could read and it's real easy reading. It's called How to Overcome Fear of Flying. And uh, we'll put a link in there That's for it. that. Uh, we have gotten some really good reviews and it, it's it's not it, my, my intention was never to win a Pulitzer Prize for for this and I think that's a safe bet that I'm not going to get one but we specifically did it we we leaned it down we gave you enough information to to put you on a path to find a way through your fear of flying and we the, the, the best part is we're, we're and we're constantly working on that we have a number of hot links in there if you have the the um, Kindle version you can click directly on the link and it will take you right to the to the place on the in the uh, cloud where you can get more information without having to dig out go to the library do all that and if you have the paperback version you can use the QR code and all you have to do is take a picture of it and it'll do the the same for you and it'll pop up on your mobile so we really encourage you to take a look at that we are going to come up with an audio version of it because people like me wait for the audio version we'll be doing that and uh we're we're, we're also going to be translating it into some different languages so uh so 12 books a year uh if we could only get the author quarantined long enough to record the book right <laughs> that's it yeah, there we go yeah <laughs> So anyway, hey, Paul, I want to thank you again. That, that was really special for you to do that. And, and thank uh, you. And, and you got your 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 10,000 steps in today for sure. But <laughs> while we were watching. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm still walking the airport. Hey, guys, thank you so much. And the hub is awesome. I really, really am enjoying that. It's it's really a great, great place to go. And what Thanks. Paul's talking about uh, is the new hub that, that Dieter designed and built that takes you right in there. You can see all the stuff we've got, stuff that we have that you may not participate or be, be aware of yet. And, and you're, everybody's going to get it. Uh, we're going to try to get it out to everybody who has like a fearless flight kit. You are now a member. Or you will be a member of this club. And, and uh, I keep talking about things like this and Dieter goes, oh my God, that's more to do, you know, but, but we are going to do that. And, we're never uh, running out of ways to serve. So that's yeah, perfect. yeah. And, and this is, these are the things that we talked about last year that are coming this year. And uh, ironically, COVID-19 kind of pushed us in that direction. So we're really <laughs> grateful for that. Uh, Eric, thanks a lot again for uh, for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, everybody else, uh, we're, we always appreciate showing up. And uh, we'll see you again next week for Fearless Flight Live. So All right. adios. See you, Paul. Have a great week, everybody. Hi, guys. Thank you. Good night, okay. See you, Paul. Thank you.